Hi, my name is Kevin Jones, and in this walkthrough, we'll see how to install the key management component from identityserver.com. Before we get into the code, however, I just want to give you a little bit of background. So you're using Identity Server, and Identity Server generates tokens, and it signs those tokens, so we can check them for correctness. And for this, it uses a signing key. And this key has to be stored somewhere secure. If you're running locally, this could be the Windows Certificate Store, or it could be a mounted directory, or you could be using Azure to do the storage. Good security practice says that this key should be changed. And typically you change the key maybe every 90 days. But this can be difficult. Just remember to change the key or putting a process in place to manage that key. So this component helps with that. So this component automatically generates signing keys. It keeps those keys in a user-defined store. So you can keep the keys, for example, in the database. And it rotates those keys on a user-provided interval. Okay, so let's see how it does that. So to show this, I'm going to need three applications. I'm going to need a simple MVC client application that we can add security to. I'm going to need an application to run some migrations to update a database, to add the tables needed to support this key rotation. And I'm going to need an implementation of Identity Server. So to build the Identity Server implementation, I'm going to use the Identity Server templates. And if you haven't installed those before, you can install that by using the command we show here. So .NET new minus I for install, Identity Server 4 templates. I already have those installed, so I'm not going to run that here. Once I have that, I'm going to create an implementation of Identity Server using Entity Framework. And to do that, I need to have the Entity Framework tooling installed. So to do that, you run .NET tool install minus minus global .NET EF. And that just installs the .NET Entity Framework tooling. And again, I have that installed. So again, I'm not going to run that script here. So I'm going to create a directory for my identity server and change into that directory and then run .NET new IS4EF. So this uses the identity server for entity framework template and creates me a new project. So let's run that command. This will ask me if I want to run the .NET seed command to seed the database once this has been created. I'm going to say yes. So now we have a project and we have a database that's been seeded. So let's take a look at that. So this is the project loaded into JetBrains Rider. Notice we have a database here, identityserver.db. When we use the template, this uses SQLite as its database. So this is a SQLite database. And in Rider, if I drag this into the database window and open this up and look inside the main schema, we can see all the tables generated for us for Identity Server. And if I run this, we can go to the browser, we can hit localhost 5000, and sure enough, there's Identity Server running. So we have the default installation of Identity Server. But before we go and add a client application, I want to add a new client into our Identity Server. So to do that, if I open up config.cs, this is where the data is that's used to seed the database. At the end here, we have the list of clients. And I'm going to add a new client called OpenIDC Client. And that looks like this. And it uses an implicit grant type. And notice the redirect URIs here are localhost 5003 for signing OIDC and for the post logout redirect URI. So now that I have that, I need to recreate the database. So to do that, I'm going to delete the old identity server.db, build my project, go back to my terminal window, and rerun the command that the template ran for me, which was this .NET run slash seed. So if I run this and go back into Rider, we can see that the database has been recreated. So identity server.db. And if I run a console here and run select star from clients, we can see we also now have the open ID connect client in the database. So now we can go and create our client. So now that we have IDS, let's go and add a client. So we add a new project, it's going to be an ASP Netcore web application, model view controller web app, no authentication, and we'll call this client. So I need to add some NuGet packages to this, and I want to add some packages to support authentication. So I want microsoft.asp.netcore.authentication.cookies and microsoft.asp.netcore.authentication.cookies. 
OpenID Connect. So once I have that in my startup, I can add my authentication code. So here we set in the default scheme to cookie and the default challenge scheme to OIDC. We're adding OIDC. I notice the authority is localhost 5000 and the client ID is OpenID Connect Client, which is the client we just added to Identity Server. I then need to enable authentication. So in my configure, before we call use authorization, we add a call to use authentication. So I want to do two more things. So I want to take my home controller and to the privacy action and an authorized attribute and then change the run configuration so it runs on localhost 5003. Oh, and back in startup, remove the use HTTPS redirection. So we're not using HTTPS here. And then I can run this. The client runs, so localhost 5003. If I click on the privacy link, that's going to require authorization. That takes me off to identity server. And if I type in the username and password, and click on login, say allow, then we get sent back to our client application and to the privacy policy page. So the authentication and the connection with IDS is working okay. So before we add the components, we need to add tables to the database that will hold the keys that the component will manage for us. So to do that, I need to update the database. And to do that, I'm gonna create another project just to run the migrations. So here I'm going to create an empty web application project. I'm gonna call this migrations. I need to add some NuGet packages to this. So we're using SQLite. So I need Microsoft Entity Framework Core.SQLite. And to run the migrations, I also need Microsoft Entity Framework Core.Design. I then need the key management packages as I'll be using classes from those packages as part of the migrations. And these are in Identity Server 4 dot key management. And I need the two. I need the key management package and the key management entity framework package. Okay, so now that I have that, we can edit startup.cs. I want to add a constructor here the takes an I configuration, and we'll store this in a config variable as we'll need this when we configure our services. I don't need anything in the configure section here as we won't ever run this as a web application, only to run the migrations. Then in configure services, I'll get the connection string that we'll use for the migrations and then set the context to run the migrations. So we'll use add key management DB context, which is part of the key management libraries. And we're using SQLite here. So for my connection string, if I go into app settings.json, the connection string, remember, is called db. My data source is that file, identityserver.db, which is up one level and then in the IDS folder. So if I build this and go to my terminal window, I need to run three scripts here. So I generate the migrations for the key management db context. I can generate the SQL for these migrations. So if I look inside Rider, we can see the code for the migrations here, and we can see the SQL for the migrations generated as well. And finally, back in the terminal, I can apply the migrations. And again, if I look inside Rider, and look in the database window, and I've refreshed this, we can now see a couple of extra tables in here. We have a signing keys table and a data protection keys table. And these are the tables that will be used by our component. So we can now set up the key configuration component. And to do that, we can do a couple of things. First of all, let's get rid of this add developer signing credential. It's not recommended for production and we don't need it now anyway, unless we'll be using keys generated by the component. To do this, we need to do a couple of things. We need to add the NuGet packages to IDS. So these are the same two. So these are the key management entity framework package and the key management package. So once we have that, we can configure the code. So there's an extension method provided called add signing key management, and we can specify some options. So here, there are a couple of required options. There's the licensee and the license key. And if you go to identityserver.com slash products slash key management, then you can get a demonstration license from there to try out this key management component. So once we have the key, I'm going to set a couple of other values. And these are the activation delay, the expiration, and the key retirement. And I'm setting these to very low values just for demonstration purposes here. 
So for example, my key expiration is 20 seconds. Now, normally in practice, obviously, that would be in the order of 90 days. So once we have that, we can then save these keys in the database. So I can call persist keys to database. And I have to tell it which database to use. So I give it a new database key management options, specifying the DB context. I'm using SQLite here, and this is the SQLite connection string. And then let me do one more thing before we move on. We can cache these values as well. So I can call enable in-memory caching to cache the keys. So it doesn't need to go to the database every time to get the keys. So once we have this, I can restart IDS. I can go back to my client. And then from here, click on privacy. I can log in and I get sent back to the privacy page. But this time I'm using the keys from the database. So if I look in the database at the signing keys table, we can see a key. And it's a key that's been generated to do this authentication. So if I give enough time for that key to expire, clear my site data, click on privacy, which will force me to log in again, and click on login, and go back and look at the table, we can see there's another key. So when the key expires, as it needs a new key to do the signing, it creates a new key for me inside that table. So we still have one issue here that we need to think about. These keys are currently stored in the database as plain text, and that obviously leads them open to attack. So .NET Core offers a feature called data protection, and we can use data protection to protect those keys. And our component lets us do that. So here, I can call protect keys with data protection. And when I do that, the keys in the database will be encrypted. So as well as using keys to protect tokens, .NET Core uses the data protection and the keys it provides to protect things like cookies. Now, an issue with this is that in a load balance environment, you have to set up where to get these keys from. And again, this component can help. So here, I can call services.addDataProtection and again call persist keys to database with the same options as above. And now this will store the keys data protection uses in this local database, in the data protection keys table. However, this leads to another problem. These keys again are stored as plain text. And again, we should protect them. Now to protect them, we can't use data protection as these are the data protection keys. So we need to use a certificate to protect these. So to use that certificate, it needs to be stored in your local certificate store. On Windows, that would just be the certificate store. I'm running on a Mac here, so it would be in the keychain on the Mac. And for this example, I'm going to use a certificate called IDS demo. And notice that this certificate has a private key. So back in the code to use this, I need to first load the certificate. And I do that by giving it a name, IDS demo, then calling find to find the certificate in the store. And then once I've done that, I can call protect keys with certificate, passing it this cert. So now we have signing keys protected with data protection and data protection keys protected with a certificate. So now that we have this, let's run the code and make sure it all still works. So back in the browser, if I click on the privacy link, it takes me to the login page and I log in. And sure enough, we're now on the privacy page. So with our component in place, using data protection and protecting the keys using certs and data protection, everything still works. So that's the end of this walkthrough. I hope you find it useful. And just as a reminder, for more information, go to identityserver.com on their products and key management. Thank you.